Welcome to a special edition of the Grueling Truth, brought to you by ReplenishingCareTechnologies.com and GridRMO.com. I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster, and today we have a special guest. We haven't had a horse racing legend on before, but when we got the opportunity to get this man, we definitely wanted to get him. He's, in my opinion, the greatest jockey in horse racing history. Help me welcome to the show, Lafitte Pinkai. How you doing, Lafitte? Uh, very well, Mike. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I, I know, I think you grew up in Panama. Your father was a jockey. Can you talk a little bit about your life in Panama before you came to the States? Well, yes. Uh, in, I started uh, playing baseball when I was very, very young. That's what, that was my, my dream, to be a baseball player. And uh, I was uh, picked to go to Nicaragua to uh, represent Panama in the Little League Championship over there. And we ended up being a champion. So uh, when we came back, the coach, he grabbed me aside and he told me that, uh, that I was going to, he said, you are a very good baseball player, but you are going to be too small. Why don't you be, you be a jockey like your father? And uh, I, was, I was sad, you know, because my dream was to be a baseball player. So, but, you know, uh, I can play baseball, but that, that uh, tip that he gave me, he stayed with me. So when I was about 15 years old, we were, my mother was very poor, working very hard, trying to keep us afloat, and I, uh, I wanted to do something to help her out. So I told her that, uh, that I wanted to be a jockey, you know, but I, you know, the only thing I knew about my father was that uh, he was a jockey, and uh, when people asked for my name, I said Lafitte, they said, oh, you must be the son of the jockey, and because he, had, he was famous over there. Yeah. So uh, my, I had to find, fight my mother for her to let me go to the track. She didn't want me to be a jockey. She wanted me to go to school. But uh, finally I convinced her. I told her that I would go uh, to the track in the morning and then go to school in the afternoon, which I did. She finally let me go, and I worked for two years, you know, trying to become uh, to learn. And, now, how do you uh, study to become a jockey? Is it was, like a school for was, jockeys or...? I was afraid of uh, jo uh, of the horses, you know, so it took me a while. So, uh, but little by little, I got to I got to learn, and uh, two years later, I got my license and I started riding. All right, so you start riding. Your dad was famous, which I'm sure maybe helped open some doors. But did it also put added pressure on you because your dad was so famous at doing the same thing you were attempting to do? Well, you know, um, not really though. Um, I um, the guy, the, the the guy that first got me to work for him. Uh, he, I was just working really hard, and I wasn't getting any pay just, just for the for the opportunity to for him to give me a horse for me to learn. And he kept me that way for about a year, and then finally I moved I moved out of his barn and went to some place else, and I started working again very hard, and finally. Uh, the guy that, uh, the trainer that I was working for, finally, he decided after a while to give me a horse for me to take to the track and, and learn. And uh, that's how I started, you know. But uh, it was, it, I, I really was working hard, you know. It wasn't easy for me. And uh, finally, I started learning how to gallop horses, and, and which is hard over there because you have to uh, gallop these horses and breathe them with no sorrow. It's like an Indian style. Yeah. So finally, when you, when they think that uh, you are, you are good at it, you know they they give you a saddle, and uh, you start uh, galloping horses with saddle and breathing with the saddle, you know, like uh, like in the races, you know. So, and then finally you go to the gate and you learn how to break from the gate. And the the we have a a professor there that uh, he will give you the. Uh, the okay, you know, when when he told you were ready, and uh, finally he gave me the okay. You know, he this is a guy that used to be a, a jockey and uh, and he uh, very courageous uh, 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 jockey and he had a lot of injuries and and he gave me some good tip about riding and 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 an example of his, you know, gave me some example of what he used to do when he was riding. He used to sit us in a barrel. We, we, we two, um, how you say, with two, with, with a rope and, you know, because we didn't have any saddle. So he kind of 
told us how to sit down and grab the reins and all that, and that's how I started in a, in a school like that, yes. So what led you to come to the States to continue your career, and how did that come about? Well, you know, uh, every, every, every jockey that uh, uh, in South America went to come to the United States, you know, we, we, hear, uh, we hear so much of it, and uh, the big jockeys that, you know, like I used to hear about Bill Schumacher when he was over here, and winning yeah. all the races, and Braulio Baeza, a Panamanian jockey, Manuel Icaza, and a lot of others, you know. So when I started riding, um, you know, I, I just wanted I just wanted a job, you know. I didn't think I was gonna I was gonna become a good jockey like like I did, you know. I just wanted a job and, and make some money to help my mother. But I started winning a lot of races, and uh, I became the the leading rider in Panama, leading apprentice rider, and then the leading rider, uh, and. Uh, uh, after two years, I was winning a lot of races. I was winning the big races over there. Um, I got a, uh, an offer to come to Miami, and, and this guy, Mr. Fred Hooper, he sent for me for uh, for me to come to Miami and and work a couple of horses for him and, and see if he likes me. So I did that. He sent me my plane tickets and everything. So. I came to Miami, I worked two horses for him, and we signed a contract for three years. And uh, so, that's how I came I came over here. All right, so how big of a, I, I know it had to be a big transition to go from one country to the other, but how big a transition was it for you, and how long before you felt comfortable? Well, I tell you, uh, I, when I came over here, uh, it was a big transition for me because, uh, you know, I... I, I I was comfortable in Panama. I was making a lot of money there for for the times. You know, they, this was in in, in 1964 to 66 that I rode over there, and I was making between 800 and 1200 dollars a week, which was a lot of money for for over there. I bought my mother a, a house. Uh, I bought myself a new car. You know, I had a, I had my girlfriend over there and everything. So when I left. I left with speaking no English, nothing, you know, just just with the hope that I'd do good in this country. And uh, at the beginning, it was very hard because I c- could speak the language, and uh, there were some some days where I won races, some day some days that I didn't win races, but I was very lonesome. And there were a couple of times when I thought about coming back to Panama, but I I remember thinking, I said, you know, if I if I go back to Panama, someday I'm gonna I'm going to be very sorry that I did that, you know. So I I kept working hard, and finally I started feeling comfortable because I had to adopt the, the style of riding over here because it was different than in my country, Panama. We Over there, we kind of, it was slower, and and it wasn't as as, may, as much trouble around the turns, and, you know, the the horses weren't as fast, and, you know, so I had to adopt adopt myself to, to the style over here, and it took me a while for for me for me to adopt. And finally, you know, I felt comfortable. I was start winning a lot of races. And then from Chicago, I went to New York, and from New York, I came to California, which I in both places I did really good. Yeah, and you get to 1973, you get to race against Secretariat, which most people think is the greatest race horse of all time. You rode a horse by the name of Sham, who was. A very good horse also. You guys came in a close second in the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. You want to talk a little bit about Sham and then what it was like to battle the great Secretariat? Yeah, definitely. I think Sham is one of the best horses that uh, that I ever rode. I think uh, I always will pick a firm first because a firm could do anything. You know, I won so many races on a firm, and Sham, I only run him in Kentucky Derby and Preakness, but... Uh, Chan broke in both of those races that he ran his race. He broke the track record, and in the I mean, on the Belmont he broke down. But uh, going to the Kentucky Derby, I thought I had a very good chance to win the race. Uh, the horse, uh, and I went by. I know that the 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 hill improved of the of his race before, and uh, uh, Frank Martin, the trainer. I remember the, the, the day before the um, the big race, he told me, he, says, tomorrow, this, he said, this horse tomorrow is going to do something that no other 
horse ever have done in Kentucky. And he was right, you know, he broke he broke the track record, but you know, Secretaria was was a better horse, and uh, and uh, it was a. <laughs> Even though it was a disappointing, you know, that I didn't win it, but it, I didn't feel so bad because the, of the type of a horse that beat me. Yeah, I mean, when you get the greatest horse of all time to beat you, there's not a whole lot you can do about exactly. it. Um, well, we didn't know that at the time. but uh, And then we, uh, we um, and then when we went to uh, to the Prigness, I thought I had a good chance to, to beat him this time because it was less distance and, uh, you know, uh, I was... I uh, was thinking that Secretaria might come from way back again, you know. And, uh, and sure enough, in the first turn, he he made a very premature, premature move around the turn, which I, any other horse would have died in the stretch, and he didn't. You know, coming down the stretch, I was like two lengths behind him, and I really thought I had him, and I just couldn't go by him, you know. And I, I, I remember passing the wire. I said, what a horse, you know. I was, I was very, very... Uh, uh, surprised and admired the 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 way he ran, and then yeah. uh, in, in going to Belmont, I knew I was in trouble. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I would think Sham Prignus would be the race where you would get him if you were going to get him. Yes, yes. But uh, he ran, he ran. Believe me, he ran, he ran so hard. You know, he he was a. Uh, Definitely one of the best horses, the two best horses. You have to pick the two best horses that I ever rode. I would say a firm and champ. Yeah. Um, so we get 1976. I wrote an, I read a story there about a horse called an act that you rode where yes. you lost the race. Um, the, there was a syndicate that owned the horse. They took you off the horse. You want to tell everybody a little bit about how you got your revenge? Oh, yeah. Well, yes. Uh <laughs> I was riding a horse called, um, uh, his name was, uh, oh, I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, 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 it, it, it was a song of uh, uh, impressive, a horse called impressive or something like that. Well, he he was a very, very good horse. He, I, I won the, um, the, uh, the San Anita Handicap with him. The San Anita, I'm sorry, the San Anita Derby with him. And then uh, I don't think he went to Kentucky. I think, and, but and then he went to to to, Holy, to Hollywood Park, and uh, I think he ran a race over there and he finished second from what I can remember because it's been so long ago. So he, the next race, he was uh, a, an easy stake on the grass, and uh, Albert Junk, who was the uh, the one who owned the syndicate. He came up to me and he said, listen, I got, I got some bad news to tell you. I said, what? I said, well, the syndicate, the syndicate decided to take you off the horse. I said, what? I said, the horse ran good last time. He had no... I said, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. That's all right. So <laughs> I called my agent and I said, and I told my agent what Albert Young told me. And, my, and I said, listen, will you... He was, my agent was surprised too. And and I said to him, listen, just give me a just just give me a, a horse in the race. So you just give me a a horse in the race. I've got a chance. So my agent called me the next day and he said, Lafitte, they, 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 this this is only like six horses in the race. And to tell you the truth, none of these horses had any chance. And they all anyway, they, they cannot beat. Oh yes, the name of the horse was uh, God. I, no, I can't. I don't remember. Anyway, forget it. Uh, he, uh, he, he said, all these horses got jockeys. There's only one horse that is in San Francisco, and I, uh, I don't think he has any chance, and I don't, think, I don't even think he's going to come here. And I said, listen, call the guy. Tell him to bring the horse over here. Tell him that, tell him that I'm going to ride him. I ride his horse. So my agent called over there, and the guy said, "No, I don't know if I if I'm going over there." I says, "But if I'll go, I'll I'll, I'll put my feet on it." So uh, a few days went by, and and <laughs> and Vince Vince, my agent Vince Gregor called me, and he says, "I don't think they're coming." He just called me. He said, "He doesn't think he's gonna call." Well, what happened was the next the next day the guy called again. He said, "Go well, we decided to come." To come down to, um, to, to, to South to Hollywood Park to, to run the horse in the stake, and I said, okay, good. 
Well, I didn't know anything about the horse. So now when the when the uh, when the racing form came out and and I saw the chart of the horse, I said, boy, the horse got no chance. It's come from way way back, you know. So anyway, well, I'm gonna give him my very best. So sure enough. You know, I'm way back, and I start working on this horse from the 5A pole. Already I start whipping him kind of early and pushing him, and, well, I don't know what happened, but at the quarter pole, the horse, he started running, and I, and I cut his horse dry at the wire. And I'm telling you, I was so happy. I raised my, my stick on the air, and uh, I screaming out loud, you know, and <laughs> that tell you, that, that was like a winning a Kentucky Derby for me because... <laughs> Because I got even, you know. But uh, those those things that happen in racing, you know. So you never know. All right. So the biggest race in horse racing, of course, is the Kentucky Derby, and you didn't win that till 1984. Was there a time and point where you thought, well, maybe this just isn't in the cards for me? You mean like winning the Kentucky Derby? Yeah, but I mean, you got over here what sixty six, sixty seven, and yeah. you know, you go fifteen or sixteen years coming up short. Oh, yeah. You're the best jockey out there. It yeah. had to bother you a little bit. Oh, oh, definitely, definitely. I, I came, I came with the hope of trying to win the the big race every year. You know, whether I had a chance or I didn't think I had a chance, I always it, it was a hope. You know, and 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 uh, you know, I I just want to win one. I want to I want to feel how how to win that race, the feeling that, you know, like there were many, many of those, those Kentucky Derby that I came back, I finished second or I finished third or, or I finished off the money and I see the, the, the winning jockey being so happy and, and everybody congratulating him, you know, I, I, it was a feel, a feeling that I want to experience, you know, and, and it was a time when I just didn't think, uh, I didn't think uh, I was, I was going to, win that race, you know, and I said, well, it meant for me not to win it, you know, yeah. but uh, the year that I won with Swell, uh, I was very lucky to get on Swell because uh, uh, Eddie Maple was riding Swell, but he was also riding another horse for 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 Steven, and uh, uh, Devil's Bag, the name of the horse was Devil's Bag, and uh, he had to make a decision which horse to ride, and Devil's Back looked like a really, a really a super horse, you know, because he will win his races very easily. So he decided to go for Devil's Back, and and Swell came up, and, and Woody Steven called me up to for me to go ride Swell in the uh, in the Florida Derby. So I went to ride him in Florida, and he ended up winning. He, he beat a horse called Dr. Carter. And uh, Dr. Carter was a favorite, and we beat him like a three-course of a lane, and it was a big race for Swell. So I really thought that I, that I had a chance to win in, in Kentucky. So I think it was maybe two or two weeks later or, or three weeks later, uh, Woody ran, ran him in the uh, Lexington ha- Handicap in, Lex- in, 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 yes, in Kentucky, in Lexington. So I flew out there to ride him, and he didn't run good. He run, he got a horse beating like a fourteen lengths. You know, I, I yeah, wasn't well, a great deal beating there. I'm sorry. Or he is a great deal. I, I, uh, I believe the saying, winner of that horse, because I actually remember that. But I think oh. it was like he is a great deal, or great deal oh. was the horse who beat him. Oh yeah, it? okay, okay. Well, and if I, I remember, remember right, the track was so sloppy. Long. Okay, so my agent. He, uh, when I came back to California, he, my agent, he called me up and he said, listen, I think uh, we should ride another horse. The horse that I was riding in California, he was the son of Sierra Slu, and he has some potential to be a good horse. And I remember, you know, I, ne- I never go over my agent, you know. I, m- most of the time I agree with what they say because that's what I pay him for, you know, unless I have two horses that, uh, that I've been riding, you know, and they look close or cheap horses because... Most of the time, the big races, I let my agent do do the decision of what horse he wants to ride. Yeah. But I remember telling him, you know, um, I don't know, no, let's stay on swell. I said, this horse, if he run his race, they are not gonna beat him. And sure enough, that's one of the best, the best uh, decision I made in my life, you know, because then uh, swell ended up winning the Kentucky Derby, and I tell you, it was. 
all that feeling that I wanted to feel, well, they all, I, it was there, you know, and uh, it was probably the the happiest day in my career as a jockey, you know, winning the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, and from watching that Derby, the thing I remember was how effortless Swale ran and how easy he made it yes. look. And, yes. I mean, I thought he was going to win the Triple Crown, but you yes. get to the Prignus, and yes. it just didn't look like anything. I mean, you, if I remember right, he had pretty good position the whole race, yes, but it just I looked like was there was something laying. missing. Yeah, you know that I have forgot about the Prignus. I thought I was laying about six, but no, he was laying there. He was in a perfect yeah. place. I saw that race recently, and and he just didn't, didn't put up. You know, he, he, he was one of those very strange races that he ran, and then... Uh, but I tell you what, when when we went to uh, to the Belmont, um, uh, the assistant trainer at the time, or Woody Steven, was a guy called Mike Griffith, and I knew him from a long time when he used to fo- work for for Mr. Hooper and and Caton Tinsley, the, the trainer that I rode f- first in, when I came to the United States. So he told me, he said, listen. This horse didn't run good in in didn't, he didn't run good in in the pregnancy because he worked too fast, and I'm telling you, he says he's a different horse now. We work him slow. He's ready. Believe me, don't be surprised if he, he's going to run a big race, and that made me feel good, you know. And sure enough, he went out there, and I I was able to put a nice pace, very slow pace, and sure enough, he won pretty easily that race, you know, and. Uh, that one of those races that you love to win, you know, and this a lot of prestige and everybody is, is 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 happy, you know, and a lot of people at the track and you know, it's it's fun to win those races, yes. Yeah, and I mean you had to develop some kind of bond with Swale and I imagine it had to be devastating what happened just shortly after that with him. Oh yeah, definitely. That I was very, very surprised that that happened. You know, I I got a, I got a call. A reporter called me about six o'clock in the morning. I was dead asleep at that time. You know, and uh, and I remember the phone rang and I picked it up and and he says I want to I want to ask you some question about about Swell passing away. And I said what? I thought he was joking. You know. Yeah. And I said, uh, I said, you know what? I, 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 I actually, I don't know anything about it. Uh, I said, how about if you call me later, you know? And sure enough, as soon as I hung up, boom, everybody was calling, 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 you know. And then finally, I called my agent, you know, and I said, you heard anything? And then he, he told me that he just heard that uh, Swell passed away, and he started telling me how it happened, you know. So most of the morning, I was answering in the phone and, and trying to tell people, you know, what I thought and everything, you know. So it was kind of sad, yes. Yeah. Um, so we'll go ahead. We'll fast forward a little bit here. Um, you're one of the greatest jockeys, if not the greatest jockey of all time. Um, your father was a great jockey, it sounds like. What does it take to make a great jockey? What are some of the attributes a great jockey has to have? Well, I, I really, it's hard to say, you know, because let me tell you, I see so many, I saw throughout my career so many jockeys that have potential to be great jockeys that they just never made it, you know. They just, they were good, but they never did nothing special. And then you see some of the guys that they are just, they are, they are not, they don't look as good on the horses. But they do everything. Everything they win. They 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 win the big races. They cons, constantly. Uh, the consistency is is always there, you know. And uh, it's it's hard to say. Well, for me, I knew that I was a hard working. You know, I had to work really. I had, I think I had to work double, so I make up because I I was having so much problem in my way throughout my career. And a lot of times, you know, I, I, I was so weak trying to ride these horses that the only thing that I tried, I, I would try to compensate, co- compensate that was by keeping myself very fit, you know, and yeah. in wearing as, as, as good shape as I could, you know. That's the only way that I was able to, uh, to sustain myself and, 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 and to be able to compete with these guys, you know, they were great jockeys. You know, there was a time over here in California that 
they are in, in one race of a horse, they were a Hall of Famer, you know. Yeah. So uh, they were all they all have different style and they they were all good, you know. And and I had to try to to keep up with him. But uh, I think for me, it was just the hard work that I put in and 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 try to um, to keep on top of everything, you know. And and that's that was that's how I did it for so many years. Yeah, we talked about the Belmont. I mean, the thing that impressed me the most just by looking back at your career was the fact that you won the Belmont Stakes three con- three consecutive times on Conquistador Cielo, of course, Swale, and then Caveat. Yeah. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the Belmont? And I would think that even though the Kentucky Derby may be a little more, more glamorous, you have mm-hmm. to take a lot of pride in being able to win a race like that that takes so much endurance three consecutive times. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, and the the Belmont, the Belmont is a tough race to win too. You know, uh, the Belmont is a longer distance. You know, uh, uh, the caution of the track is, yeah, I think, it's a little different than 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 than, than the Preakness, the uh, in, in Baltimore and in in in, in Kentucky. Uh, you know, uh, and it, sometimes fresh horses come in. Uh, mile and a half is a, a lot different than mile and one quarter. You know that that extra little bit of distance it makes a lot of difference. You know, so yeah, you have seen so many so many horses going into the into the um, Belmont and winning already already winning the uh, the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness and they f- they fell they fell in in the Belmont. You know, it's a very tough race to win. And uh, yes, I. You know, it takes it takes a really a really a good horse, a good ride, and a good trainer to to win those races. Yeah, and then you spoke earlier about Bill Shoemaker. I mean, that had to be really special for you. I think 1999 at Hollywood Park Racetrack. You, I think you were riding Irish Nip, but you broke the record previously held by Bill Shoemaker for the most wins ever by a jockey. You want to talk a little bit about that day? Yes. Well. Like I told you before, Bill Shoemaker, I hear, I hear of Bill Shoemaker ever since I was a little kid. And, uh, uh, but first, when I, when I was an apprentice rider, I remember one, one time I was, I was only 17 years old, and, and I, I, uh, this girl that was my girlfriend, and we went to the movie, and then after, after, they used to give you two movies in Panama. So between one movie and the other, they start putting the news, and I remember a, a, a rerun of uh, uh, Johnny London winning winning on George Royal, his last race. And I uh, I remember it was something like a six thousand three hundred and something thirty two something like that. And I remember telling my girlfriend nobody ever breaks that record, you know. Yeah. So and then when I came to the United States, I happened to. To uh, to meet Bill Shoemaker and we became good friends and uh, 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 his wife and my wife became good good friends and we used to celebrate or win this every weekend you know we go eat, eat at, at, at a place called Chason in Beverly Hills and in another place called Mateos in in Westwood and it was fun you know get getting to know him and. Uh, and then he broke uh, London's record, and I remember when he <laughs> when he broke his record, I said nobody ever break that record, you know. Yeah. So and then it came a time when I was getting close, you know, I was getting close to 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 break the record, and I just boy for a while I didn't think I I was gonna do it, you know, because I wasn't riding any good horses. I but I uh, I happened to change my diet. I start eating a lot better. I start eating a lot of things that I never ate before, like fruits and nuts and and more vegetable and, you know, and things like that. I completely, completely quit drinking, and, boy, my career took off again. Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't a, I wasn't, it's not, it wasn't the drink, the drink that, the quitting the drink, it was just the, uh, I quit drinking because of the, the weight, you know, trying to, to, to get a better yeah, weight. Yeah, make weight. Because I only drank on weekends, and if I drank, I drank maybe one 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 cup of wine or maybe two cup of wine. That was it, you know. Yeah. So, but I tell you, it is so much for me that diet, and I start winning races again. I started to 
win big races and 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 uh, little by little I got, I closed the record again and I ended up breaking it and I tell you I was so proud of it because I really didn't think nobody was gonna do it you know so for me to do it it was uh, a dream come true and something that uh, it was a really uh, a, a big effort and I was I was very proud of myself. So what led to you retiring, making that decision? Well, well, when I um, um, I was doing really good at Santa Anita, you know, there was a meeting over there. I was fighting Leon Ryder with Pat Valenzuela, and uh, uh, I was riding. I I felt like I was riding so well and winning good good races, you know. And then one day I rode his horse course Trampos two, and coming around the turn. Uh, this kid uh, that just came from France, and he uh, he moved inside, and his horse drift out right in front of me, and I I couldn't avoid it. You know, I tried to avoid it, but I I I I couldn't because my horse, this type of horse that when you when you fight him, he even if you want to get him out, he want to he, he want to even mo- get more in. You know, so I couldn't get him out, and boy, he went down. And I ended up breaking my neck in three places. The second vertebra, they call it, they call that the hang, hangman fracture. It broke in three places, you know. So yeah. when I came back, the doctor advised me that I that I should retire. So uh, it was very painful for me to do that because I was doing well all the time. My 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 way was good, and I was I was enjoying myself going every day and riding, you know. So. Uh, it was a it was a tough thing to do. So did that make retirement tougher because you didn't get to kind of retire on your own terms? Yes, I wanted to go until I just couldn't, couldn't anymore. You know. Yeah. I I never put any any time that I said, well, I'm gonna ride until this or I'm gonna no. I I was doing so well that I I was gonna go as long as I could. You know, as long as I until until I just couldn't win any more races. You know, I you know I. I didn't never thought about retiring, being on top or anything like that. I wanted to go until until I uh, couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. So, do you still follow horse racing? Well, some sometimes I get to go to the track. I know only for the big races. Sometimes I I pay attention to it, but most of the time I don't. You know, I'm very busy taking care of. I go visit my mother every day and almost every day, and go to the gym and and come home pay my bills i i do a lot of traveling i i travel to um for events for the permanently disabled jockeys and i get to go to my country panama more more often now and um i just uh last month i was there twice i went for for a race that they do for me over there and then uh, uh i i did a little speech uh, for uh, motivation to some people that were at the track that day, and then somebody hear me talking and he says, uh, "How about if you come back next week and uh, we hire you for you to come to to say to uh, say a motivational speech to the people from some bank?" I say, "Yeah." So I came back next week and uh, you know and they pay me well and, and it was good. So I yeah, might, you can't I beat might that do it again you. soon. <laughs> huh? You can't beat that. <laughs> it was just yeah, yeah, exactly. talk. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, did you watch the Kentucky Derby this year? Yes. What's your take on always dreaming? Do you think that it should be able to win the Preakness tomorrow? Yes, Do you think it's got I, a I think shot at horse, Triple Crown? Yes, I think that horse is going gonna, is gonna to be very, very tough to beat. But it's no, no. I don't think it's going to be an easy race, though. I think there's about two horses there that they have a very good chance. The horse number one that finished second, his name is uh, Looking at T. Yeah. This horse, he had a lot of problems in the in Kentucky. And the horse Classic Empire, he had a lot of problems, too. You know, and, and the one finished second and the other one finished fourth. And this is the horse that I like for the Kentucky Derby Classic Empire, and he had a lot of problems. Believe me, he he he. I, I I tell you, if I was a jockey, I would try to lay a little closer to the pace, and uh, and make my move from there. But he is gonna run good, I think. 
Yeah. All right. Um, Lafitte, it was great having you on the show tonight or today. Um, would love to have you back sometime, but okay. truly an honor to have you on today. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Lafitte. Okay. Everybody, that was Bye. Lafitte Pinkai, the greatest jockey in horse racing history, at least in my opinion, for what that's worth. I don't know. But uh, make sure you check out our sponsors, replenishingcaretechnologies.com, www.gridarmo.com. Go to thegrillingtruth.net, check out all of our, all of our shows. Um, last night we had former Seattle Seahawk Dallas Cowboy kicker Efren Herrera on the show. You can go check that out. Um, Coming up, we've got Livingstone Bramble, former lightweight champion of the world. He'll be on tonight. So make sure you check out all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher. Wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Lafitte Pinkai, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.